Now, at least for several centuries, it's been pretty obvious that the economy is something of central normative significance that among institutions, in many respects, the shape of the economy is very much central to the fate of justice, however that be construed. And one has seen that very much agreed upon by all sides of the very contentious struggles that have marked the modern world. First, in the rise of capitalism from the feudal world, where the avatars of a market system were defending it against the alleged barbarity of feudal privilege. Similar normative claims were made by the avatars of colonialism and imperialist expansion uprooting the traditional societies that stood in the way of the march of maybe this initial version of globalization. Normative claims were made when a labor movement emerged. <coughs> Very early on, of course, in the development of the economy to defend itself against the unrestrained workings of the marketplace. And likewise, the movements on the part of the state to protect civil society from the market and to protect politics from being overcome by the power of wealth. There are the contests between those who are concerned with overthrowing markets entirely and replacing them with a public administration of commodities and occupation. Things were contested in the so-called communist revolutions, which in many respects supplanted traditional pre-modern forms of existence, such as in China, and instituted a society where everyone became dependent on the market, even if the market in question was one controlled by the state, where everyone became a wage laborer employed by the state. And of course, the economy continues to loom large as a central consideration of justice. In the current controversies between those who want to liberate the market from any political encroachments, those on the other hand who want to see capitalism in a human face through greater political public intervention. Well, on all sides of the various divides that continue to haunt us, you know, there is a common recognition that the fate of what is right and what is wrong depends very much on how the economy itself is structured, and secondly, how the economy relates to other institutional spheres. The family on the one hand, the state on the other. <coughs> Now, despite the fact that it is common knowledge that it is the economy stupid that is very much what needs to be addressed in some respect for justice to be either upheld or brought into being, there is nevertheless a very pervasive understanding that conceives economic relations such that they cannot possibly be matters that have any normative character. Instead, economic relations are looked upon as being defined by two types of, two types of relationships, which could be said to fall outside the domain of right or wrong, to fall beyond good and evil. On the one hand, economic relations are looked upon as natural in character, as forms of a metabolism, an anthropological metabolism that is rooted in the human condition, understood as something given by nature. We have a nature, of course. 
we have a biology, we are animals, and as animals, you know, we have a kind of mediated metabolism that requires that we do not just use chlorophyll to take in the general elements of our environment and sustain ourselves. No, we have to go after particular objects of satisfaction and engage in particular exertions in order to sustain ourselves. Our life depends upon such metabolism. And we have biologically determined survival needs which require specific activities in order to maintain our own individual existence, let alone to allow for the upbringing of those who can't care for themselves as well as to reproduce ourselves as a species. Well, look, admittedly, every, every kind of association we might get involved in or that rational agents might get involved in. And I've argued elsewhere in my most recent book, The Living Mind, that rational agents, it has to be embodied in the living animal. Um, so you can look at that to see to what degree that, that claim can be upheld. But to the extent that rational agents per se are embodied in the living animal, one could say that in all their enterprises, they have a nature that involves natural requirements. It requires certain things to be done for their biological being to preserve and uphold itself. There is indeed a metabolism that is operative. Of course, it's questionable whether an economy is to be understood as nothing more than an exercise in human metabolism or in the metabolism of well, rational agents, whatever their species, whether they be. In our solar system, or often, you know, many of the solar systems where habitable planets are being found more and more often. There is this metabolism, but can the economy be reduced to an exercise of something given by nature? Of course, if it were, it's a matter of necessity. And the character of the economy understood as a metabolism is something that cannot be other than it is. It's a natural faith. And so, as Marx, at various junctures of his career, would say, the life of freedom begins beyond the economy. <coughs> Economic affairs are a realm of necessity, not a realm of freedom. As such, they're really a domain that, as natural, is not one in which we can worry ourselves about what the economy ought to be. What it is is given by nature. It is not something that is up for us to choose how it ought to be organized and what it ought to be. Rather, it has a fundamental character dictated by natural necessity. It is something governed by needs that are dictated by our given biology and the satisfaction of those needs and activities that are equally dictated by our species being. If you regard economic relations as being of this character, it makes no sense to think that economic relations could be relationships in which matters of right and wrong enter in. These are matters of necessity, beyond which questions of right or wrong can first arise. Now, alternately, there's been a tendency to conceive economic relations not just as natural in character, but as being functions of the self. Um, I use a term in the just economy. Uh, I speak of monological relations. Monological referring to a single subject as opposed to dialogical relations involving relationships between at least two individuals. Well, economic relations have tended by many to be thought of as being determined in terms of the self, in terms of, on the one hand, the psychological operations of the individual, whereby, for example, as you find so prominently in much contemporary uh, neoclassical economic theory, is a tendency to think that matters such as price determination 
are basically rooted in the psychological estimation the individual makes of how much they want something, which may be given in a certain degree of scarcity. Or in other words, what determines essential factors of economic life are psychological reflections, matters that concern the individual and how the single individual reflects upon its needs and objects it finds in its environment. Likewise, when it comes to activities of production, there's a tendency to regard the production of goods as being once more a monological process or a process of itself relating to other things but not to other selves. Just a relationship of technique where we have an agent mastering material, imposing form upon it. Where production is merely a technical matter. Well, technique is normatively neutral. It's something that operates with given ends. Not concerned with determining what ends we are seeking. And it's something that can be critiqued purely in terms of technological considerations, which again have nothing to do with right and wrong. Likewise, questions of psychological estimation. <coughs> once again, have nothing to do with relations between individuals, if they are determinative in their own right. Relationships that would involve uh, room for rights and duties, which always involve reciprocity and a plurality of agents. No, it's just something regarding the psyche and things. Likewise, there's a tendency to regard distribution monologically, or as a function of the self, where the distribution of goods is regarded as simply a matter of administration, where ruling agents agency assigns how things are to be distributed. Once more, it's an exercise of technique. In this regard, all affairs that might be regarded as specific to the economy are regarded as being exercises of instrumental reason. That is, a technique, a reasoning that's concerned with finding the appropriate means to give an end. All of this means that the, the economy is not something that could be considered a domain in which questions of right or wrong apply. It's precise that these completely undetermined what ends are to be pursued and simply engages in what activities that involve the relation of the self to itself or the relations of the self to things. Now, one of the striking things about uh, the development of economics is that, or the theorizing about the economy, is that on the one hand, it has largely been developed as a descriptive science. That is, it is concerned with describing a certain type of activity. And of course, if it's concerned with describing a certain kind of activity and modeling it, such theory is not in any position to tell us what ought to be done. Right? Because what happens to be done is no measure for what should be done, unless one can independently determine that what happens to be done is what ought to be done. Simply describing the operations of activities that are identified, either naturally or technically, of being economic and thereby being, in a sense, normatively neutral, are susceptible indeed of only a descriptive approach. But it's recognized that what is being described here is something that isn't just a matter of psychology and it's not just a matter of technique, it's something that pertains to the operations of an institution of a type of association. In fact, of a type of, inso of association that is not limited to the household, that is not limited to the state, but in a sense is global in scope. 
And so far as there's nothing about these kind of activities that warrants their limitation to within the confines of a particularly political boundary, as opposed to extending beyond it. That is to say, the descriptive theory is describing something that involves a form of association of, of a plurality of individuals. And indeed, it's, it's begrudgingly recognized that even though what is being dealt with in purely descriptive terms is something involving agents, when it's for some reason or other not bothering to raise any normative questions as being appropriate to thinking about the economy. Right? It's, it's going to now be developed, let's say, as a social science or a mathematized uh, study of choice theory, which is descriptive in character, uh, perhaps operating on the assumption of modern social science that science proper can only be value neutral, that any attempt to deal with questions of norms and values is beyond the limits of reason. Yet, what is striking about the development of economics as a descriptive science is that it only comes into being relatively recently. There is no economics in this sense prior to well, the rise of capitalism or the Industrial Revolution. And that's symptomatic of the fact that it can't be such a science until it has its object before it, namely such a thing as an economy. Because even though those who treat the economy as something to be descriptively considered think of it as being determined in terms of either natural or monological, psychological, and technical parameters, they somehow have to confront the fact that their very object is something that has arisen within history. Has risen within history. That's to say, it's a convention. It's a form of convention. It's a form of convention in the sense that it is not something given independently of the concatenated, concatenated choices of individuals who have somehow or other chosen to subscribe to certain patterns of association and conduct. In other words, the economy as such <coughs> has appeared to have arisen only in relatively recent times, <coughs> which in and of itself should indicate that the economy is not a natural object, but something that is a product of willing, and not individual willing, not a technical willing that operates upon things, but a willing of a plurality of individuals who, have, who are choosing to interact in a very specific way that is specific to what comes to be called as an economy. And the economy did not exist as such prior to modern times, which is to say we're dealing with something that need not be we're dealing with a form of life that could be other than it is. We're dealing with something that thereby, precisely because it is a product of history, is inherently normative. Because we can raise the question of whether it is what it ought to be. It need not be the way it is. It can be done away with. It can be supplanted by other forms of, of life. And for this reason, if we understand the economy as something that does come to be only historical, that it is a form of convention, that it is not defined by natural relations of human metabolism or technical parameters or matters of psychological um, estimation, which of course are all functions that exist throughout history as preconditions of historical development. Well, if we realize we're dealing with something that comes to be at a very particular time in a particular development, 
one cannot help to recognize that economics should be a prescriptive, not a descriptive investigation. In other words, the theory of the economy is dealing with something that is a normative institution. And it so happens that precisely because the economy can be regarded as a normative institution, it makes sense for you to be here and not in the business school listening to those who perpetrate economics as a descriptive science. Economics is something that ought to be dealt with normatively. And only philosophy can deal with what is normative. And it's important to recognize that philosophy cannot deal with conventions in a descriptive way. I mean, this is something that, in a sense, you, you come across in whenever you're dealing with philosophers worthy of, of the name. Um, you know, they never provide theories of what the state is, what the economy is, of what the family is, of what property is. Rather, they are always conceiving what the state ought to be, what the economy ought to be, what the family ought to be, if they deal with energy consumption. That is something that cannot be done by observation. Observation and description can never tell us what any institution ought to be. Again, why? Why? No, it's descriptive. In other words, we have the fact that you find certain forms of life or certain types of behavior operating does not make them valid. It just tells you that they are. We need some other way of establishing whether they are what they ought to be. And the fact that they're conventions and something that can only emerge historically indicates that there's something arbitrary about their existence. It depends upon the choices of individuals, whether they are what they are. So for this reason, there's no way that you can close your eyes and ears and forget about historical testimony and just think what the state is, what the economy is, what any type of convention is. Because there's no necessity that what is a convention of one sort or another, what is a product of willing, has to be this as opposed to that. It's arbitrary what exists. Precisely because we're dealing with what is conventional, not what is given by nature. And that's precisely what allows these domains to be domains in which questions of right or wrong enter in. We can concern ourselves with what ought to be. Precisely because we're dealing with domains that are conventional. And the only way that reason can determine anything pertaining to a convention is normative. In other words, the philosophy of the state or political philosophy has to be normative. There can be no descriptive philosophy of political association. And in fact, if you want to have any kind of certain indisputable account of the political as opposed to the economic, as opposed to the household, it can only be given through a normative investigation. Because if you recognize that convention is contingent, no description can tell you with any certainty what you're dealing with. I mean, how do you draw the boundaries? You find a certain kind of political organization before you. How do you know what politics as such is on the basis of your observation? Because what you find before you will be different from what the state was at some, in some other locality, in some other place. How do you know where politics begins and ends if all you can rely upon is observation? Fine, you might want to appeal to how a term happens to be used by some linguistic community as if people use terms in just the same way as if there was unanimity, which of course it isn't. But even if you were to accept that, that presumption which is often made by those who appeal to 
language use, as if that's the only locus for determining anything. You know, it's still not clear why how a term happens to be used has any authority in terms of defining what it is applied to. But a normative investigation, to the extent that we can think what it ought to be, can draw the boundaries of what is deservedly political, of what is deservedly economic, of what is deservedly familiar, I suppose, to these other domains. Now, in a way, if, if one wants to deal with uh, the economy, uh, you may have noticed that I was speaking about how one might happen to have, find, to have found it emerging, at least in large measure, as a historical phenomenon. Which is why there could be a descriptive theory of the economy at a certain point in time, maybe when, when the object was present, an object that is a convention and thereby subject to normative evaluation. Well, when I speak of the emergence of the economy, I'm speaking of something that is not just a matter of the emergence of the economy. And I think it's important to keep in mind, and we'll see the importance of it, and it relates in a way to the way in which I'm framing our, our subject matter. Namely, the emergence of the economy involved an extrication of the kind of activities that became isolated in an economic sphere from entanglement with other kinds of activities that involved, on the one hand, kingship relations, and on the other hand, relations of power. Because it so happened that the historical development which give rise to an economy also give rise at the same time to a household, to a family that is disengaged from economic affairs and equally to a body politic that is disengaged from both kinship and well, economic affairs. In other words, the birth of the economy is something that is associated with the emergence of a discrete political domain lording over what has come to be called a civil society, containing a sphere of activity where individuals interact in specifically social ways, not political ways, and also not in household ways. So we have a household that likewise has extracted itself from the activities that we come to know of as operative in the economy. You know, prior to these developments, you had in all sorts of different ways the kind of things that become independently realized in the economy being immersed in the unity of the household, or immersed in forms of community in which, for example, your birth, which is to say your kinship relations, determines just as much what you do, what your occupation is, as well as your relationship to rule, which is to say that these different spheres have not been separated. Now we're going to, uh, in a sense, become more familiar with what's at stake in these kinds of historical separations, which give birth simultaneously to an economy, to a disengaged household, to a distinct body politic, to a separation of state and civil society. And you know, I'm presenting this as a, in a sense as, as, a, as an historical process that has occurred and is still underway, and underway in differing degrees of development in different places in the world. But to speak of it descriptively is not to raise a normative issue. In a sense, this very distinction of domains allows one conceivably to speak of 
there being norms that are distinctly economic in character, that can be distinguished as economic from political norms, likewise from family norms. All of this presumes that normatively speaking, one can distinguish these different domains. That if we're thinking in terms of the rubric of freedom, there are different rights and duties that are operative in politics, in distinction from what is operative in civil society, which will include the economy, as opposed to the family. Now, of course, one has to consider, if this is a normative question, whether there ought to be such a separation. Does what is right require that politics not be connected with kinship relations, with wealth, or that rather justice requires that these spheres are demarcated, or that the realization of freedom does require that there be an independent sphere of politics. It is shielded from the power of wealth and from kinship relations. That there's something wrong with nepotism as opposed to something positive about it. Well, these obviously are, are key normative issues that have to be resolved before one can really speak of there being such a thing as a just economy. Because to speak of there being a just economy, or to speak of there being distinctly economic rights and duties, presumes that there should be this separation of spheres, which may have happened to occur in varying degrees in modern times in various parts of the world. But we have to inquire into that, obviously. And I think we are going to find reason to see that indeed these demarcations are of crucial significance for the realization of what is right. Now, we face a difficulty in that the most prevalent types of ethics or normative theory, the theory of ethics is the highest good, maybe most classically pursued by Aristotle, and then the ethics of liberty, of social contract theory, pioneered by Thomas Hobbes, developed by, by John Locke, Rousseau, Kant, and then all sorts of modern um, uh, subscribers. Well, both of these normative uh, approaches which have tended to dominate most discussion in ethics, turn out not to really have much room for a separate normative domain that is economic and character. These different kinds of theories have find themselves really unable to give the economy any specific independent affirmative value. At best, it can serve as something that is instrumental for upholding norms that are located fundamentally in the political domain or located otherwise in property relations. So in a sense, we are going to have to contend with that and see indeed whether these approaches are adequate or whether there is another approach that not only is more adequate in general in defining the challenge of nihilism, right, the challenge that Reason is powerless to determine what is normative, what is of value. But uh, well, we will overcome, or we will have to overcome, the challenge of nihilism. And we'll have to see what kind of normative theory is genuinely worth pursuing. And see to what extent there is room for a discussion of the economy as a separate domain. Now, I've mentioned that we are going to be concerned with considering how the economy ought to be considered in relation to the state. Well, to some degree, obviously, I'm jumping the gun. I'm presuming that in a way we can speak intelligently about the normativity of the economy, and thereby speak of it in relationship to other spheres, which themselves have a normativity of their own in their <coughs> demarcation from other domains. Well, if indeed we are to take in any respect the historical emergence of the economy as a clue to, in a sense, 
what might be the objects of a properly normative, prescriptive theory of what the economy is, uh, it, it is going to end up, or it may end up, that the economy is inherently an institution that stands amidst other institutions that is presided over by a body politic that itself incorporates households, <coughs> which incorporate individuals who are both property owners and moral subjects. All of these different dimensions of normative agency have to be taken into account. And for that reason, it will be unavoidable to raise the question of how the economy ought to be in relationship to these other normative spheres. And we will need to address that. Now, my strategy in this course, where we will attempt to resolve all these issues, and believe it or not, answer the fundamental questions we're addressing. Well, our, our strategy can operate in a twofold manner. I, I, I want us to, on one hand, get some exposure to what it means for the economy to have emerged to start with. In what respect there is not an economy in pre-modern pre -modern times. And there's something very different about how activities that are part of what we consider an economy function in the situations that have dominated most human history, where there was not this disengagement of economic matters from kinship and from politics, or of politics from kinship and social matters, or of kinship from social matters and political dimension. Concerns. You know, I want us to get some exposure to this, uh, which in a certain respect provides a, a kind of, well, at least something to think about to dislodge certain assumptions concerning the natural character or the psychological or technical character of, of <coughs> economic affairs. I want us also to get a handle on the major ways in which economics has developed as a descriptive science and to see what the fundamental options have been. And then we really need to look, in conjunction with all of this, at the approaches in normative theory that will allow us to, first of all, resolve what ought to be in general, and more specifically, to consider how an economy can fit into what relation has to the state. So our readings are going to involve a smorgasbord of these different kinds of uh, uh, investigations and questions. Um, for example, for our first for our first session, where you will have read something, I hope, uh, something from the syllabus, uh, you'll find in Harold Brennan's essay, the initial essay, his book, The Worldly Philosopher, which provides accounts of, of various political economies. Uh, what he calls the economic revolution. He, he, he wants to expose the way in which the emergence of the economy as a distinct domain was something that was very much unnatural and involved a real upheaval and a complete transformation of values. I think it, it, it will be helpful. It may be a little bit jarring, but it will be useful to just sort of see this to begin provoking your thought. On the other hand, Pagliani, in his essay, Aristotle Discovers the Economy, will be, in a sense, give you uh, a way of, of, of thinking about and approaching Aristotle as someone who has a very different way of looking at the kind of activities that become independently liberated in the emergence of an economy. And it gets a sense of a very different type of norm to take on what I think many of us have come to regard as natural or as beyond question. I think it will be a, a good way, even before you've read Aristotle himself, to get a handle in how, well, there's, there's a very different way of thinking about human affairs that has to regard the economy as suspect. The economy is an independent domain. And so 
you know, I'm hoping that reading these two essays this will begin to give us some exposure to, uh, to the kind of issues we'll be dealing with. And I I'm going to ask you to turn partly to my book, The Just State, to discuss some fundamental questions concerning modern theory, and then to look at Aristotle's politics, where he will be discussing, in a certain sense, not an independence here of economics, but rather the household and the, the polis, which for him are the two do legitimate domains. Even though, of course, there is a certain discussion of intermediary activities. But we want to get a sense of how it was that uh, Aristotle, to some degree reflecting the historical formations of his day, but also, maybe more importantly, reflecting a fundamental approach to ethics, construes matters pertaining to what we will be considered as economic affairs. And that's what we will begin with. Uh, in our initial meetings. Now let me just point your attention to one of the earliest um, dealings with you might call it economic matters. Some of you might be familiar. Um, some of you have read The Republic. If you haven't read The Republic of Plato, you should read The Republic. That can be one of your summer reading assignments. But at a certain point in The Republic, you may remember that for those of you who have read it, and those of you who haven't read it, um, Socrates is having his usual discussion uh, with young interlocutors. Uh, he sends the basic question on the table is what is justice? And he begins portraying a certain kind of association that you might think is something akin to an economy. It has to do with an association of individuals who engage in different occupations to which they are each naturally most suited. And these occupations are such that they produce objects that serve as means of satisfaction for the natural needs of the individuals in question. So we have a kind of natural division of labor based upon the natural talents of individuals devoted to producing goods whose character is defined by the natural needs of the individuals. And you can see that in this situation, where the community is concerned in a way with producing things, and in a certain respect also distributing these things, that there are obvious limits to what is produced and what is consumed. What is produced and consumed are objects that are defined in a sense by the biological requirements of the humans that make up this community. Now you might say that this is very similar, for example, to, well, a social insect colony where bees or termites or whatever. Uh, you have different members performing different tasks that are defined by their natural abilities that happen to produce things that are coordinated to satisfying the needs of the community at large. These are, again, biological in character. But there, there's a fundamental difference. It's symptomatic of why the organization of termite colonies or beehives varies only when there is a genetic transformation in the members of those organizations. Whereas in human communities, there are changes and transformations that occur irrespective of any change in the genetic makeup of the members. In other words, you know, this organization involves individuals who, even though they happen to have organized themselves to pursue tasks for which they are naturally fitted, that, as it turns out, happily enough, naturally correspond to the natural survival needs of the individuals, it's still something where the individuals in question 
as human individuals, have a faculty of choice. Where, in a sense, they have the ability to alter the character of their production, as well as to desire what they do not biologically need. Socrates speaks of this community as being a city of pigs. There's certain some, you know, similarities to an animal community. And it can be scoffed at at that level and dismissed. But on the other hand, there's this other element. If it operates on these terms, it operates on these terms on, in terms of naturally defined occupations and naturally determined uh, consumptions. Because the individuals involved have ultimately chosen to engage in this kind of, of, of cooperation. Interestingly enough, the individuals in question are pursuing tasks where the end in question is always the particular object that they are producing. What is not the end of anyone's activity is the form of the whole. Now, Plato goes, Plato, I should say, Socrates goes on to speak about how, well, precisely because these individuals do have will, they can choose to engage in productions that go beyond what is naturally needed just as they can choose to want what they don't need physiologically. They may choose to want the iPhone 4S. Mm -hmm. And they may have to produce other things to get in exchange. And as a result, they end up having to go beyond their own community to trade with others, which leads conceivably to all sorts of imbalances where certain things are not being produced as needed. And so in a sense, the natural harmony of a community, like a social media community, predicated upon the limits of need and activity prescribed by the species being of this group is disrupted. It's an unhealthy city, a feverish city. And to reestablish the natural order, there is need to introduce a different kind of activity, an activity of a completely different sort from the enterprises that the members of the city and pigs engage in. And it's an activity that's concerned with imposing form or order upon the whole community. It's an activity that instead of pursuing the particular end of a particular production that satisfies a particular need, we instead here have an activity that is concerned with willing into being the form of the whole community. Willing, in a sense, an end, or realizing an end that is universal in scope, at least with regard to the community. And this is an activity that also requires, of course, knowledge of that form. In a city of pigs, you have a kind of natural order. Yet, the natural order operates without any one who belongs to it having to know what the order is or having to will what the order is. But when we now introduce this ruling element into the community, we have a community of a different character, a community that cannot exist unless the form of the whole is will and know. And on this basis, of course, Socrates is speaking about the distinction between the body politic or political association and the kind of association that we find in, well, the city of pigs. Now, to some degree, there's something similar that seems to be subscribed to by those who develop classical political economy, famously Adam Smith. Namely, the idea is that the economy is an order in which individuals are pursuing particular ends. They're engaging in an interaction with others in pursuit of satisfying their own personal needs. By providing something that will satisfy the needs of others, no one is willing or engaging in, a, in an activity that orders the whole association in which they're participating. Yet it turns out that individuals who are simply pursuing self-selected particular ends that are such they can only be satisfied 
by the pursuit of others of similarly self-selected particular ends. Well, it turns out that the whole has a certain kind of order. It has a certain kind of lawfulness. But this is a lawfulness that operates, so to speak, behind the backs of the participants. Because it's not a lawfulness that's promulgated by anyone. No one wills it into being. The constituents of the economic order pursue particular ends, the universal form of the association they are partaking in is willed by no one. In this respect, you could say there's an invisible hand at work. Unlike the body politic, where of course one institutes a constitution, one then makes right, positive laws on its basis. One could be said to will ends that are inherently universal in character. Here we have a sphere in which individuals pursue particular ends of their own choosing that can only be satisfied by interacting with others who are engaged in the same type of activity. And yet, somehow, this produces something that has an order of its own. In fact, precisely that has an order of its own that is not ruled by anyone allows for there to be an economic science. Because what would the situation be if the order of the whole or the form of the economy, so to speak, were something that was willed. If one willed the shape of the economy, there could be no economic science. Because it would be arbitrary. It could be whatever one chose to make it. Well, think about these matters. We come to the, actually, we have to come to the, have to go to 445. Well, you can think about these as having something to do with what, in a way, allows uh, allows the proponents of a descriptive economic theory to think that they have something scientific. Maybe that they're dealing with a kind of order which is such that even if the participants are arbitrarily deciding to engage in occupations and satisfactions and needs, that ultimately depend upon their own choice. But nevertheless, the very framework in which they operate has a form that's given independently of their particular choices and is susceptible to some kind of analysis. Well, let's see to what extent that really is the case. And obviously, the whole question of whether the economy is a self-regulating system is something that we will want to investigate. Um, obviously, there are those among the early political economists who want to say it is. And that has very specific normative ramifications. Namely, that it is self-regulating, and that self-regulation has certain very salutary <coughs> benefits, which means that one should practice let's say fair that is, let the economy operate on its own interfere with it as little as possible. On the other hand, you have to keep in mind that if indeed the economy has its integral existence only in so far as you have a political domain that has separated itself from the economy, and a household domain that has separated itself from both wealth uh, and production and the exercise of rule, in a way the economy is all, always situated you might say in between. And maybe in between not just <coughs> the household and the state. It might also turn out that society, or we might call it civil society, involves other institutions besides the market. <coughs> and I'll just put before you some of them that might be, after all, historically they're there. And we want to consider normatively whether they should be there. But they will have you know, important consequences. One is the domain of civil law. And civil law is going to be regarded by one of the writers we're going to be looking at, namely uh, De Soto in the book The Mystery of the Capital, as being something that has a tremendous impact upon the economy. And he's going to make an argument which we're going to explore to the effect 
that one of the reasons that markets have had problems developing in many of the so-called underdeveloped nations has to do with a deficit in the institutionalization of civil law and the legal uh, protection and certification of property rights. That because civil law has not been fully realized. It's impossible for capital to operate with its full resources. And we, we need to look at these questions, maybe. Well, what is the connection of civil law with the economy? And by the way, civil law is distinct from the law that is made by the state. And the fact that there can be a law, an administration of law that is social in character, not political in character, you know, is, re is reflected in such things as there being a common law, such things as there being international legal conventions that deal with matters pertaining to social rights. Well, that's one domain to think about. It can be thought of maybe as falling within civil society, yet outside the economy. There's also the field in which social interest groups operate and operate in a way that impacts upon the economy. And I'm talking about social interest groups like labor unions, business associations, consumer groups, all of which engage in a very distinctive kind of activity that takes place within civil society that is not directly political in character, that has a very specific relationship to the economy and the market. And one needs to think about what are the proper bounds of that activity, what can it achieve, what should it achieve. And then there's a third element in civil society that might be thought of as operating with respect to the economy. And that has to do with the public administration of welfare, which operates in, in varying degrees, obviously, in very different countries. You know, to provide what neither private intervention in the market can achieve nor what the independent operations of the market can achieve with regard to upholding the social rights of individuals. Well, again, we want to think about to what degree there should be such an administration of welfare, what its limits ought to be, what it can achieve, and what impact this has in thinking about how the economy operates. So we're going to be thinking about, on the one hand, the economy as a distinct disengaged domain, but it's also going to be an institution that operates in the context. Potentially. I mean, factually it does. Potentially it might be that it should operate within a society that is civil to the extent that it includes not just the market, and its free wheeling operation. But civil law, as well as a domain for social interest groups to operate, and a public administration of welfare. All of which will be presided by a certain kind of political order. It will have to have a certain character uh, in order for it to be what it ought to be. Well, we have a lot, lot to cover, uh, but I think we will do it in a way that will be sweeping enough and deep enough to seriously address uh, these questions. Are there any questions that any of you have regarding anything brought up? <laughs>